I'd like to thank Professor Erickson for inviting me and, and Glenn for hosting me. Um, this is my first time to Finland, first time to any Scandinavian country. Uh, it's very exciting. It's, uh, it's gloomy just like back home right now. Well, as Glenn mentioned, that uh, I've been at Northwestern 33 years now, and I was doing what we would call core facilities as a faculty member when there were no core facilities, right? We did these as collaborative ventures. And so, uh, I'm an associate professor. I never even applied for a professorship because they didn't know what to do with me. I collaborated. As Glenn mentioned, I've worked in across a variety of fields, just like you do. But we didn't know what that meant back then. So I got tenure, and I just continued to do what I did, which was build microscopes, one-of-a-kind things. Um, I built photolithography equipment to grow patterns for cells, to watch them migrate. We did all kinds of cool things, uh, but I didn't fit in. And then when the opportunity in 2009 became available to be the director of core facilities, I wasn't quite sure what that meant because I never charged anybody. It was collaborative. We published papers, we wrote grants, paid my salary that way. I had students and then I didn't have students anymore because I liked doing it myself. So by 2009, I had an opportunity to look across the institution at these emerging core facilities and ask how we could do this in a professional manner. So what I'm going to share with you today is what's happened over the last 11 years. Tomorrow's talk will be more for sort of the faculty administrators who want to know how do you do this and how do you do it well. And I'll share experiences with them. We've been fortunate at Northwestern. I've made some good guesses and I've made some bad guesses, and I'll share those with you what worked and what didn't work. But now, 11 years later, it's working. So let me focus on career development because when I first started this, everybody thought a core facility is where the really cool instruments are found. And that's not a core facility. A core facility is where the really cool people are found. That's you. The people who can do things other people can't do. It took us a number of years to figure that out, that it really was about the people. And that's why the talks I give now, three in China, I'm in Singapore, next month I'm in Belgium, I'm in the Pasteur Institute in Paris, I'm at Oxford, around the world giving talks that's all about the people. Six years ago, the leadership of the National Academy in the United States published this paper. It was outlining a proposal to change the model of staffing in research labs from grad students, primarily grad students and postdocs, to professional staff. They called out in this paper, this is Bruce Alberts at the time, was the president of the National Academy, and these are all other members. You recognize Harold Varmus, I'm sure, Nobel laureate. We recommend increasing the ratio of permanent staff positions to trainee positions, both in individual labs and in core facilities that serve multiple labs. To succeed, universities will need to employment policies that provide these individuals with attractive career paths, short of guaranteed employment. Also, granting agencies will need to recognize the value of longer serving laboratory members. If adopted, this change would help to bring the system closer to equilibrium. There is a precedent for such a polity in the intramural NIH research program which employs many well-trained masters and PhD students as staff scientists. Two of the likely consequences of this change is in graduate and postdoctoral training and employment will be an increase in the co unit cost of research and a reduction in the size of laboratories. So there's a price to be paid for this professionalization of the research enterprise. Nine months later, the president of Johns Hopkins, Ron Daniels, Hopkins, if you don't know, is the largest research institution, university institution in the world. It is number two in the United States is Michigan, which is a $1.5 billion a year operation. Hopkins is 2.3. It's that much bigger than everyone else. It's a very large, and this is the president. Wrote a very similar article in the National Academy, basically making the same point. And I point out here, one area needed to reform is to identify our entering scientists for our entering a diverse set of career options, including a permanent staff scientist track. In this regard, a focus on core facilities at universities 
may be especially useful. So what I'd like to share with you now is sort of what happened. That Those articles were published four and five years into my new role. And I was appreciating annual reports and trying to understand the core facilities. We have about 50 on average uh, at the university at any one time, trying to understand who's in there and the like. But those articles changed my perspective to the people and the opportunity that I saw coming. If the leadership of the country was making those recommendations, I knew this would eventually come. So at Northwestern, based on fiscal year 19, you see, Consider it full time if your 75% of your salary is paid by the work in that facility, either on a grant or by the recharge uh, income. For us, that's a total of 131 people last year. 33 are research faculty, that's 33 of them are running core facilities. Research associates uh, with PhDs working in their postdoc. We even have a postdoctoral training program now for core facilities. Senior technologists, the total PhDs, the top group, 73. 58 who are non-PhD, 131 in total. So we're a very PhD heavy. And again, the point um, in our model, and it's not the only model that's out there, is to hire people of extreme competency whose job it is to help the faculty move their research programs forward. I'll have more to say about that shortly. We created a job-specific family for core facilities. We weren't the first ones. In fact, one of the things you're gonna see about my talk is I borrow copiously from all around the country in the US, good ideas. And these ideas had been already implemented in a number of institutions, uh, Vanderbilt, um, schools in New York City, and, and the rest. And so I thought this was a, a good place to start. So the, we uh, differentiate two kinds of positions, a core technician and a core scientist. The core technician is inward focused, right? Working with the, within the facility. They solve technical problems and they're kind of like the PI outsourcing work that could be done in their own lab, but they simply don't have the expertise uh, in their lab to do it. A core scientist is a different world. This is an outward looking, outward focused. They're the face. When a faculty member, postdoc, grad student comes, they sit down and ask, what's the problem? Tell me about the science. What is it you're trying to do? Let me think through. You say you want to come and do a measurement, uh, you want to use a confocal microscope. Why do you think a confocal is the right microscope for this problem? It might be we have something else that's even better for you. It's a consultation. They're problem solvers, right? They're here to help you find the answers to the questions you have. They're not worried about how to technically actually make it work. They have the expertise to do that, but that's not their focus. And they're more like a consultant to the PI, right? So the first consultations are free, but after that, we're not free. They pay for additional information and input on helping them solve their problem. And then their managers. Now I'm going to take you through a series of job descriptions that helped HR to get their head around why not only are these jobs different and need to be, and they're compensated differently. We pay our core facility people very well because we recognize how, and we have the high expectations of what they're going to do in return for that good payment. And we recruit internationally for these jobs, the leadership jobs. So effective management requires technical skills. Somebody asked me, gee, do you think I have a shot at being a person who could work at a core facility. The first thing I ask them is, when you have a problem in the laboratory, who do the people go to? Do they come to you? Are you the one who kind of knows how things work? If so, then that's maybe something that's telling you you could fit into this world. The technical skills include all these things. You can read them, maintenance of instrument, training of people, developing service, assisting with data analysis, all of this you're very familiar with. How many people in the room here actually work in a core facility or a research platform? Okay, almost all of you. So I don't need to go through a whole lot of this in detail with you. Um, business skills. I suspect most of you in here don't have this. Um, and that's because you're scientists like me. 
I didn't know anything about business skills either. You have to learn them. Even as PIs, we had to learn how to manage our grants. I didn't realize it was going to be so complicated over the years how to manage the money. Even in my own household, my wife manages the money. I don't even do it. So, but when you're running a core facility, what I tell the scientists is if you don't learn how to do this, you're not going to last very long in this job. This is trying to figure out how to turn this position that you have into a lifelong career path. If you can figure out this piece, I think uh, there's a good chance you're going to be able to do this for the rest of your career. So, what do I mean? This is what we call cost studies, how to establish the prices. Um, there's a business course that I'll tell you a little bit more about shortly. Uh, pricing is an interesting phenomenon. Um, who knows what a Berkham bag is? A Bikram bag? A few of them. What's it cost? This is a handbag. $5,000. $5,000. It might be $50,000. Who in the hell pays $50,000 for a handbag? People do. Who set that price? How much do you pay for a Tiffany watch? Or um, how much do you pay? You know, think of all the expensive things in the world that people buy, artwork. Who sets the price? The market sets the price. So it is for you. The market sets the price. If you're really good, people are willing to pay for yours. This is why we're able to have substantially high salaries for the people. If you're really good, you're worth a lot. So we teach them about setting prices. We also have to teach them how to do accounting, managing at Northwestern, different, these are our numbers for different accounts. Um, the 160 account is the recharge, that's the one you generate from people paying. And if they're paying with grant money, it's under federal regulations. So in the United States, we have a series of rules and regulations. I chaired the committee that created the rules and regulations because they didn't exist for core. Core facilities is something new, so the federal government didn't even have any rules. In what's called the um, circulars for the Office of Management and Budget in our Department of Commerce, we had one paragraph, a famous paragraph we call J48, one paragraph about, this was in 2010, of what you can and can't do wasn't helpful. So we wrote the rules. And the rules apply to this account. So we put our own dollars into other accounts where the rules are Northwestern's rules, not the government's rules. Again, government rules, because if faculty are paying with grant dollars, the government tells you how you can spend the money. Maintain a method and system for tracking. Uh, this is institutionalized. I know you have one here that you use. What's it called? The system for tracking usage, billing, reporting. What's it called? SOP. SOP. Does that sound familiar? You're all using a similar one? You probably should be using a similar one. Open eye, oh, open eye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's the one. So, iLab, Stratacore, Idea, Eli, we have our own, it's open source called NU Core. We have six universities in the US using it. We've developed it together. So, that's for tracking and for billing. We analyze surpluses and deficits each year and keep a record of all of this. These are just some of the business aspects of the job. Then there's dealing with the users and the faculty. So those are what we call communication skills and administratively managing your staff, preparing reports, participating in annual surveys, feedback from customers, various ways of getting information out to the user base about your services, um, which include websites and promotions, uh, workshops and advanced training, promoting outreach activities. For us in education, we define, or I define these for my course, educational is anything we do within Northwestern for our people. And it can be curricular or non-curricular, but it's education. Outreach can be K through 12, it's education, but that's not our responsibility, so we call that outreach and work that we do with our industry clients when maybe they want to do a workshop. So each year then we collect all this information in the annual reports. Here are other skills.
skills that you need, team building skills, strategy and decision making, marketing. I mean, team building is essential once you get to three or four people. It's not as um, obvious when you have two people or one person working in a core. Most of our cores start with one person and then we have to gradually grow it up. And that's its own challenges. Then there's writing skills both for communicating and grant writing and publications. Publications are a big deal. We, um, I have an advisory board. I'll tell more about this tomorrow, but um, it's an administrative board of the other associate vice presidents, the research deans, and core director from each of the three schools. So the three schools I oversee are the medical school, the engineering school, and the arts and sciences. So the research deans from those and one core director are all on uh, the advisory board, and we put together through that board and a group of working core directors publication guidelines for all of our faculty and users, the whole university, to make it clear when should they be on the publication, when shouldn't they. The answer is that conversation should happen as early as possible in the collaboration. I'll give you two examples that we used for why we did this. One example was, um, these are real examples. Somebody came in, wanted help from the core to generate some data. So they helped him generate the data. Then they wanted help from them to make the figure. So they made the figure for them. Then they wanted them to write the materials and methods section of the paper and the figure legend. And then they went in and published it with no acknowledgement of where that data came from. And we were like, no, not acceptable. Another example was someone came into the facility. This one was a mass spec facility and came in. They were told how to calibrate the instrument, generated their data, created data, created an abstract, put the name of the core director in the abstract. The core director went back and said, okay, now show me again, step by step, how you generated this data. Show me your calibration curves. They had not done it. And Core director said that we're not publishing this abstract, or at least not with my name on it. They took his name off the abstract. And when they published it, his name was on the abstract. And he said, and we said, no, not acceptable. So there has to be communication here, quality. The R and R, rigor and reproducibility today is very important that everyone follow the guidelines of this training. So we instituted publication guidelines, which at Northwestern is on the website, the front page, the home page of the core facility website. And then there are professional development opportunities. The business course, I think I'm going to show you a little bit about that here. Professional societies focused on core facilities and consortia, like Eurobioimaging. And then advanced training courses that you can all go to in your own discipline. These are all part of this career path that we're describing here. So early on, um, I had sat in on another course that Northwestern had created for scientists who wanted to learn business skills. And this was a one week executive education course. I sat in on it and said, oh, I like this. This is a good idea. Um, why don't we create something like this for core facilities, but targeting exactly what the people in core facilities do and what they need. The other one was really designed for postdocs and early career. The postdocs who might want to go work in pharma or early career faculty who might want to start a startup company uh, to give them enough understanding of the business world to get them a little jump start. But in core facilities, we have our own issues. Some of them just went through in the last couple of slides. And so working with our business school, the Kellogg School of Management, I created this course. Gleb just took it. It's in its, it just had its sixth year. It's once a year. It's the second week of November each year. And we teach a variety of topics under the leadership and management. So here it's building organizational culture. What that, um, what that means in a nutshell is what the business people say is culture eats strategy for breakfast. Let me explain that to you. Strategy is the plan, how you're going to change the way everybody does their science. That's your strategy. The culture is the way people behave. So at Northwestern, 
we have two schools of uh, campuses that are separated by 12 miles. The medical school and the law school are downtown Chicago. That's where I spent the first 22 years of my career there. That's a hierarchical structure. Medical schools, the dean rules. I would never, if my chairman, I go to my chairman and ask for something, he says no, I don't go ask his boss for it. It's like, if dad says no, go ask mom. But on the other campus, that's exactly what they do. On the other campus, in the engineering school, the arts and sciences, they'll go to their chair, which is a rotating chair, not a chair like the medical school in the States where it's for life, it seems. Um, they'll, they'll go to the dean. If they don't like what the dean says, they'll go to the vice president for research. If they don't like what he says or she says, go to the provost. If they don't like the provost, they go to the president. And you know what? If they don't like the answer from the president, they go to the board of trustees because they have friends with money in their pocket to help them do their research. It's the Wild West. So that's what I mean by culture. You have to understand these are different. So we call the, the latter a flat culture. Nobody's in charge. Everybody's just trying to do their own thing. And in a world of core facilities, that creates its own challenges. So hence, the need for the deans from these different schools to all be in the room together to have these discussions. If we're going to have publication guidelines, the medical school is like, of course, you've got to have publication guidelines. The other schools are like, what are guidelines? <laughs> guidelines? Is that kind of like a policy that we ignore? <laughs> so that's what we mean about culture eating strategy. You have to understand your culture. So leading with influence, how you, you can learn these things. In the business world, there are really great examples and models of how to use um, these strategies to, to move along your, your interests. Strength-based leadership, innovation and IP. Strength-based leadership is an interesting concept. It's a notion that's contrary to the way I was taught uh, as a youngster. The way I was taught is, let's see what you're good at. Okay, you're really good at this and this, and you're not so good over here, so you know what? Spend more time over here and get good at this. Strength-based leadership says, mm -mm. what are you good at? Go with that. Emphasize what you're good at. And what you're not good at, hire somebody. Build a team. And in core facilities, that's the way you handle problems. You don't go out and teach yourself everything. Know what you're good at and surround yourself with people that complement what you're good at but are good at other things. And in the business world, that's what they do. Then there's management topics like accounting, managerial accounting in particular. It's its own style of accounting that's standardized across the business world. Creating market value. How do you establish yourself as a leader and pricing that follows it? Strategic marketing. That's how do you break down the, the different groups out there that might be interested in what you're doing and strategize. Which group do I go after? Am I trying to, in my core facility, help everybody? Maybe. Maybe I shouldn't help everybody. Maybe I should focus on a few groups. One strategy would be the big labs who actually do imaging and don't do it really very well. They're a target. Strategy would be help somebody in that lab, show them what you can do for them, and then the business will come. Another strategy might be new faculty who are just showed up for school at your university for the first time. A, strat a strategic marketing strategy would be find out who those are and invite them in. And I've already mentioned value pricing. What does it cost for your service? One of the things we've taught them is you have to, uh, that the federal guidelines requires, you charge what it costs you to deliver a service. Well, if I hire two people with a bachelor's degree and hire two people with PhDs, it's gonna cost more for this service with these PhDs. It just is. Well, you're allowed to charge more. Well, it better make sense that you needed PhDs to do this work. At Northwestern, you can see we're heavily PhD. Why? Because we really are problem solvers. Faculty don't have time to learn all these various expertises in, in the different fields of core facility. That's our job. We help them. They don't need it, but we need the expertise. So in this course, in 2014, when I first started, very typical, the first year, 
I didn't even open it to the outside world because I wanted to see how it was going to flow. It was going to need some changes. I suspected it did. A couple of the professors weren't invited back. There's seven each year. So in the first two years, one wasn't invited back and the other one was asked to change the lectures. Next year didn't, wasn't invited back. So you change and turn them over. They're paid for this, so they'd like to, but if they're not going to modify their lectures to be appropriate to our world, what we need to learn, then we move them out. Now we've been pretty stable. We opened it up the next year and some balance, and now we're taking off, and now we're having more from outside taking it. And you can see down here, international, we've had British Columbia, McMaster, McGill, Queensland, Australia, and Gleb from here. U.S. universities all over the country have taken it. Even hospital centers and institutes have port facilities. Okay. Professional development. So this is the presentation I gave back in October in uh, the University of Minnesota. Now I'm going to talk about you're not alone. You're here. You have colleagues within the institute here and within the couple of universities that are here. But you also have colleagues, like through Eurobioimaging at other universities, they're part of your network. And what I want to talk about is something that I got involved in 10 years ago. So the Midwest Association of Core Directors is an organization I co-founded 10 years ago. It was the first chapter of the national organization, the ABRF, the Association of Biomolecular Resource Facilities. Now, the ABRF had been in existence at that time, 10 years ago, for 20 years. The first 10 years from 1980, whatever it began, 87, something like that, to 97, it was all proteomics. It came out, the group who formed this came out of the Protein Society. Who's ever heard of the Protein Society? Yeah, it's a niche. Um, how many have heard of ASMS, American Society of Mass Spec? Okay, that's a big group. The founders of ASMS came out of ABRF. Mass Spec became so big. So first 10 years, what we would call proteomics today. And it was created because the first instruments, commercial instruments in mass spec, the, the state of the arts, were just coming out. And there was a subgroup in the protein society who were skeptical that this box could do what they were doing. They were building their own equipment. They're, they're part of my generation, right? I'm an instrument builder. I did my PhD with electrical engineer. Did my postdoc at Bell Labs. I built the first CCD-based imaging system in the world as a postdoc. That's what they were, right? In the 80s, that's what we all did. People my age, we built instruments. So the companies were starting to build boxes. You plug in your sample and it reads out the data. And they were a little suspicious. This is what was inside the box. So they created this organization for the first couple of years. It was just a subgroup within the Protein Society. Eventually, they formalized the group, the ABRF. The next 10 years, the Human Genome Project took off. And so for that next 10 years, genomics became a part of it. And next-gen sequencing and arrays, uh, had, Sanger sequencing had moved into the automated piece. How many here are genomics people? A few. That's when ABRF became the home for um, the genomics people. And eventually it gave rise to the National Gen International Genomics Society. Um, it's just called ASG something. Uh, so these are these are temporary holding patterns, if you will, as new technologies. Then a decade ago, I'm an imaging guy. I said, you know, let's add imaging, and then we added the same year administration. So I was an administrator too. So we added both, and now we've added almost all the other fields to the ABRF. So it's an international scientific society dedicated to advancing technologies, education, communication, and reproducible research in the operation of shared scientific resources. It's a 5013C, a US term for a nonprofit. Founded in 89, uh, has over 700 members, 21 countries. Um, it promotes research, technology, communication, education. It's member driven society, so all the membership and uh, all the the leadership are all non-paid positions. It's all done um, 
because we want this to happen. Members access unique resources and professional opportunities through the organization. Here in annual um, meetings, the vision to accelerate breakthroughs and discovery and our values committed to advancing the integration of technologies, education, communication, and reproducible research in the operations of shared scientific resources worldwide. Supports best practices, research excellence, and reproducibility in discovery and promotes a collaborative community that cultivates professional development and technological innovation. Here are now the what I created, co-founded with my colleagues in the Midwest. And Ten years ago, we were the first chapter. The ADRF had existed, but chapters hadn't. Now we have six chapters spread around the country. And the ABRF, 124% of the total membership of the ABRF are from the Midwest. So that's a fairly disproportionate number, uh, given that there are five other chapters. And here's the breakdown by states. Annual meetings, career development support. We have a mentorship program that we created. I chaired the committee that created the mentorship program. And we have research groups. Research groups are really the heart and blood of uh, the ABRF because the research groups do experiments. Remember back when we were talking about that mass spec instrument? That's when they created a research group. That was a group who said, we're gonna take this instrument apart and void the warranty to look inside. And the research group did that. And they went and they then ran their samples through like they were accustomed to to see how everything worked. And they published a paper then another paper. Then other instruments started coming out. And they started doing the same thing on those instruments. Then they started publishing papers comparing instruments. That first 10 years, all in the mass spec field. And eventually the mass spec field took off on its own. Its membership now is 6,000. All started with this group, but it spun off. The proteomics representation in ABRF has now shrunk because they have their own society. Genomics expanded, and now it's spun off, and it's shrinking down. Imaging is expanding, and others are spinning off. Eurobioimaging, for example. So it's kind of a place to let this begin. Research groups are the ones who dig into the technologies and the techniques, and standard operating procedures, and share samples with each other, and run them on not only different instruments, but on the same instrument in different locations to see how they compare, and then write papers and publish them. It has its own journal, too, the Journal of Biomolecular uh, Techniques for Publishing. So research groups are a key element, and awards are given to the top group each year. You can see Engage, it's across institutions, the research group, they connect with peers at the meetings, collaborate with corporate partners oftentimes. The interesting thing is you're learning this, too, in the core world. The companies want to know the answer. They're making all these instruments and selling them. They don't even know if they're performing at the same level. They have technical specs back in the industry, uh, back at the company before they ship it out, but they're not running samples like you are. So they're very interested, and oftentimes they'll underwrite the cost of the study. And it provides a career path towards recognition and leadership in ones. And I mentioned the journal. I've published three papers in there, all on administration. They actually published stuff on administration, too. I did the first paper in 2013 on external customers. And uh, myself and um, five colleagues from the ABRF, all administrators, at five other universities, so six universities in total, well, we wrote this paper. and. I was the lead author on it. What we were trying to do is, is explain what are the rules and regulations, because we were just, my team was helping to write the rules and regulations. Uh, what are the IRS guidelines on what we can do? Have you ever heard of unrelated business income? That is the income we get for helping uh, external clients, particularly industry clients. Last year, $6 million of external clients' income. We have to pay taxes. So this laid out all the rules of how to do this back in 2013. Um, then in 16, we did Metrics for Success, same group of authors, um, helping universities develop 
metrics for evaluating court facilities for the administration. And then in 2018, I wrote an article that I'll, tomorrow's talk will be more about, which is a retrospective at Northwestern after 10 years of how to build a sustainable portfolio, of course, and shared what we had learned, all published in JBT. And I mentioned the mentoring program. We have, at this point, 35 pairs that we have ongoing right now of mentor-mentees. They're one-on-ones, meet once, or, once a week. Um, it's, the pairing is still done manually at this point among members. Um, it's, it's growing, but I think we have more mentors than mentees at the moment. We're still trying to get... Uh, more of our young scientists to take advantage of this. So the benefits of being a mentor, improve communication skills, develop leadership and management qualities, reinforce your own skills and knowledge of your subject by sharing, increase your confidence and motivation that you do have something to share with younger people coming along, engage in volunteering opportunities, and enhance your CV. And for the mentee, learn from experience of others, increase your social and academic confidence, become more empowered and learn from those other experiences and be able to better navigate the choices available to you, develop your own communication skills and interpersonal Develop strategies for dealing with personal and academic issues. Identify goals, establish a sense of direction, and gain valuable insights into your next career option. So, why you should participate in ABRF or the European equivalent, CTSL, that's the Core Technologies and the Life Sciences. These are both life science organizations and cores. Um, there isn't one in the engineering sciences yet, so we're helping them think through whether they want to have their own or whether partner with us. But CTLS um, has been meeting every other year now for a number of years here in Europe. Similar values for both. Enhance your professional profile, develop skills, expand your network, learn from your colleagues about best practices, contribute to cutting edge research. The blogs we have as administrators, oh my gosh, it's been a lifesaver to have a blog through the ABRF where somebody can pose a question that, well, we would like to do the following. Has anybody else ever tried this? And the responses are amazing. It's just, it's just like boom, 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 boom. Within 48 hours, you've gotten a cross section of what everybody's doing in the country and you get to decide what makes sense for your institution. It's very helpful. And the membership fee is fairly small. In fact, uh, there's a this year new members for just $25. And um, what they started, basically what that means is um, the reason for that is it, it's usually a hundred dollars registration to come to one of the chapter meetings. That hundred now counts towards your 125, so that reduces you to 25 if you went to a chapter meeting and paid the registration fee. It's fairly inexpensive. All right, that's where the formal part of the presentation ends today. I invite you to come back tomorrow if you want to hear more about the details, the nitty-gritty details of how we created something that I now think has a indefinite future, that it's sustainable. One example, these are very expensive to set these things up. How do you keep them going? If somebody gives you $10 million to set up something, it's gone. You've spent it. Now, five years later, you've got to figure out how to keep it going without another $10 million. And that's what we figured out how to do. We got lots of different tricks to the trade, as it were, of how to make that happen. But today it's career development. So I'm going to stop now. Thank you for your attention and take questions.